Truth Lies in Bedtime Stories from See Through News. Series 4 The Quiet Revolutionary The Heroic Role Played in a Plot to Assassinate the King by Someone You've All Heard Of by Sternwriter. Episode 1 Dad, Me, and Jimmy P. Prepare yourself for a story that embraces the 19th century internet, the guillotine, dodgy watchmakers, a blowgun, and Pitt the Younger. But first, it's only fair to warn you this story contains a double layer of hero worship. First, there's a hero worship my father had for the hero of this story, a man you've all heard of, probably, the man who, one way or another, dominated my father's working career, spare time, and retirement. Then there's my own hero worship for my dad, one of whose favorite lines was that he hoped to die at the age of 100, stabbed in the back by a jealous lover. In 2018, dad fell a bit short, dying just before his 88th birthday. And in the end, it was a stroke, not a jealous lover. But if nothing else, dad taught me to squeeze the pips out of a good gag. I think of my father every day, which makes it strange to think of him as dead. For someone you love, there's no such thing as a good death, but now time has drawn the sting a little, I'm wondering if Dad's life wasn't about as good as it gets. For sure, Dad's life certainly shared many similarities with that of his hero and the hero of our story. Dad was born 106 years after his hero had died, but both rose from humble origins to command the respect of their peers. Both led great adventures of lives. Both had a lifelong love of learning, foraging across a broad range of interests. Professionally and in private, both men had a knack for connecting with all sorts of people from all levels of societies in rapid transition as they responded to existential external threats. Both led remarkably independent careers in a business usually under the thumb of big institutions or big money. Both were active members of many networks of like-minded colleagues, first as mentee and protégé, then as mentor and protector. Not bad lives, then. Not bad at all. When I eventually girded myself to trawl through the contents of Dad's study following his funeral, I found a trove of Books, documents, slides, reproductions, photocopies, and facsimiles. This trove forms the basis of the story you're about to hear. Dad had no training as a historian, yet over the course of his life, he managed to assemble pretty much all the available evidence, references, histories, and accounts relating to his hero. For you, I suppose, it could look like an obsession. For us growing up, of course, it was normal. In our family, the object of Dad's hero worship was an extra family member. Jimmy P, we called him, though that's not the name you'll all know him by. Now I say it, it does sound a bit strange. Sharing a dinner table with someone who's been dead for more than 250 years. But, as you're about to discover, there are many amazing and frankly unbelievable aspects to the life of my Dad's hero. Strangest of all might be that despite his many achievements in an astonishing range of fields, the only reason we all know this Londoner's name today is thanks to a Frenchman who stumbled across his work decades after Dad's hero was buried. The work across which that Frenchman stumbled was a 65-page essay published in 1817. This pamphlet barely caused a ripple at the time, nor for the best part of a century thereafter. Yet, you all know the author's name. Or rather, what was named after him. As I trawled through Dad's trove, I came to understand why my father felt such an affinity for this long-dead fellow Londoner. 
Jimmy P. shared the same timeless qualities I admire in my father, principally empathy, compassion, observation, and listening. The story I'm about to tell, though fictionalized, is based on all those historical documents about his hero I found in Dad's study. I'm just a storyteller, cribbing off his notes. Any authority I can claim is obscure and marginal. But Gerald Stern and his hero Jimmy P both loved the obscure and the marginal. Both were scientists, and I want to respect their respect for facts. You may be fine with just hearing a good yarn, but as I'll explain at the end, I'm quite picky about sifting fact from fiction. As the story unfolds, I'll try to be as clear as I can about which parts are gospel and which imagined. Now, your understanding of the imprimatur bestowed by the claim of gospel status, of course, rather depends on your own degree of biblical fundamentalism. Religion was about the only biggie I can think of on which Dad and his hero might have diplomatically agreed to disagree, given that more than a century separated their time on this earth. That's not much of a schism. But that's enough hero worship and nitpicking. We have a tale to tell. As advertised, you're about to hear the true story of the heroic role played by someone whose name you all know in a literally incredible plot to assassinate the king. All strapped in? Dim the lights. Close the door. Blow out the candles. And get ready for the story of the quiet revolutionary. Episode 2, The Cauldron. (laughs) At the time of our story, James Parkinson is 39 years old. James qualified as a surgeon a few years back and is now establishing himself as a physician. He's taken over the family business from his apothecary surgeon father, John. James works and lives with his young family at Number 1 Hoxton Square, London. In 1794, Hoxton is one of London's more fashionable addresses. But London is changing and changing fast. Britain's industrial revolution and imperial expansion are in full swing, and its capital city is full to the brim of incomers seeking a living, a fortune, or asylum. The surgery at Number 1 Hoxton Square is busy. On its patient list, the well-to-do are being joined by the hand-to-mouth. Poor weavers, carpenters, theatrical lowlife. The fine, high-ceilinged rooms of Hoxton's handsome townhouses are occupied by landowners, merchants and professionals whose horizons are ever-expanding. In the gaps and spaces around them, Hoxton's attics, basements, courtyards and alleys are filling up with those whose vision extends no further than their next meal. Let's dodge an oncoming handcart piled high with chair legs. Let's sidestep that grimy-faced child bearing a basket of spindles. Let's pause at number one Hoxton Square, skip up the stairs, slip through the front door and peek into the physician's waiting room. There, in the upholstered armchairs, are the fine ladies and gentlemen of Hoxton. They hold perfumed silk kerchiefs to their noses. On the wooden benches at the other end of the room are labourers and skivvies, pungent with labour. The surgery door opens. We catch a glimpse of our hero. Now, historians, I discovered from Dad's Trove, have only turned up one physical description of James Parkinson, All we have to imagine James's appearance is this, written by a geologist colleague of his 26 years after James died. 
<clears throat> Mr. Parkinson, it reads, was rather below middle stature, with an energetic intellect and pleasing expression of countenance, and of mild and courteous manners, readily imparting information, either on his favorite science or on professional subjects. So, it seems that in later life, James was, to his geologist chums at least, modest and mild-mannered. But our fossil-hunting biographer didn't know James Parkinson at the time of this story. Age 39, James is passionate about politics. It's 1794, five years after the French Revolution. He's hardly alone in this, but James's interest is more than passive. Devoted though he is to his patients, James also devotes all his spare time to writing pamphlets which urge reform in order to avoid revolution. James's pamphlets are shared with like-minded professionals as they correspond up and down Britain. One of James's close friends is John Smith, bookseller of Lincoln's Inn Fields. Now, in 1794, bookselling is booming, and John Smith is thriving. Every day, more people learn to read. Everyone's hungry for knowledge. One by one, old truths are being exposed as ignorance, fakes, and lies. They're calling this the age of reason for a reason. But in 1794, bookselling is also a sensitive business. Whether they contain truth or lies, books hold knowledge, and knowledge is power. The powerful want to be the ones who determine which news is true and which is fake. The powerful don't trust the swinish multitude to decide for themselves. Only when their fear exceeds their greed do the powerful relinquish any power. In 1794... Book selling is a dangerous business. Every few days, John Smith tells his friend James about another printer or publisher who's been arrested for sedition or treason. They all protest they're only advocating reform in order to avoid bloodshed, but they all end up in the courts, in prison, and, more often of late, even swinging from the gibbet. James, John, and their circle of reformer friends wonder how long it will be before it will be John Smith's turn to be arrested and have to plead his innocence. Many of England's emerging middle class in possession of an education but no land worry about losing their livelihoods. Bookseller John has good reason to fear losing his life. Times are so strange, John Smith's head is as much at risk from his own government as from any revolutionary. For John Smith, as for his newly literate customers, books are opening eyes, just as the government is shutting mouths permanently. James and John's fellow reformer and good friend, George Higgins, who works at a chemist shop, likes to say that books are both tonic and toxin. A couple of years before our story, bookseller John Smith and chemist shopman George Higgins and a couple of other reformer friends took a risk. They concocted a cure for the affliction, a tincture of words and thoughts they hoped might relieve Britain's malady. They founded the London Corresponding Society. The London Corresponding Society has rapidly become a major node in a nationwide social network of like-minded, concerned professionals. These reformers, anxious Britain may be about to follow France into revolution, meet to discuss their dilemma. They usually meet in secret in taverns and coffee shops throughout the land. You might call them chat rooms. These corresponding societies communicate, share, and spread their ideas via the postal service. This new content delivery network is growing at phenomenal pace, boosted by brand new communications technology. 
In 1794, Robert Stevenson was three decades from demonstrating his rocket locomotive, but the tracks, figuratively at least, were being laid. Canals, roads, stagecoaches were spreading across Britain like cracks across thin ice. These new communication channels convey not just coal, timber and grain, not just John Smith's books and George Higgins's tinctures, but also James Parkinson's pamphlets and impassioned letters of the London Corresponding Society. Conveying letters has become too complex and important a job to be left to street urchins and servants. There are now specialist postmen. The Royal Mail founded by Henry VIII, is now getting seriously professional. The year before the events of our story, their rising status and critical role in the Age of Reason has been marked by the provision of uniforms. For the first time, you can spot a postman. Round the kingdom they speed, spreading data in packets, from inn to inn, from tavern to tavern, house to house. This union-wide web is astonishingly rapid and efficient. Its sheer scale makes it impossible for the government to monitor. It also makes it easier for ordinary people to conceal their intentions and their identities. Unlike the uniformed postmen, correspondents can conceal themselves in a cloak of anonymity. James was among the first to join the London Corresponding Society, and its core is now formed by these three friends, James the physician, John the bookseller, and George the chemist's shopman. If you're wondering what a chemist's shopman is, that's how the court records that Dad dug up record his occupation. No, I'm not entirely sure what a chemist shopman does either, but George Higgins is a minor character in our story, so let's crack on. London, in 1794, is no place to loiter or lollygag. In 1794, the stench of revolution is gusting across the Channel. The capital's coffee shops and taverns, like the Shoreditch Tavern in which we find James, John and George, now they've left their places of business, team with the newly enfranchised middle class. Doctors, lawyers, industrialists, artisans, merchants, they all gather. They're terrified that revolution might snatch away their hard-won status. They're also thrilled that reform might enhance it. They pour over pamphlets, news sheets, newspapers, these correspondents trying to sift hard fact from the gush of rumour, speculation and fake news. They talk and talk, but they talk in low voices. Manservants, wenches and hawkers, illiterate but no less interested, linger, hover, eavesdrop. Among them are spies in the pay of the Prime Minister's increasingly paranoid Attorney General, John Scott. John Scott has instructed them to keep an ear out for Britain's would-be Dantons, Marats and Robespierres. The Attorney General's snitches get bonuses for successful arrests and convictions. These whispered conversations and private letters sometimes end up in print. Anyone who can hold a quill seems to be writing a pamphlet on the political situation. Some wave the flag and say the Attorney General's iron fist is insufficiently ferrous. They tend to publish under their own names. Most, however, urge reform. Many of them, fearing reprisal from the unbending Attorney General, protect themselves with pseudonyms. You can feel England bracing itself. But for what? Revolution? Repression? Reform? No one knows, but everyone wants to know. Nine years before the events of our story, a London insurance agent was bankrupted by a Jamaican hurricane he decided it was time to look for a steadier line of business. He started 
a newspaper, giving it the modest title of the Daily Universal Register. The quality of its continental coverage, particularly the astonishing events in Paris, soon gained the Daily Universal Register a reputation as one of the more reliable of the mushrooming array of news sheets. Six years before our story, the Universal Register rebranded itself as The Times. Simpler, more eloquent, much more gravitas. But in this crowded Shoreditch tavern, the three wigged heads we now see huddled together are not concerned about the Times' masthead. Amid the tavern's hubbub and bustle, they're poring over the tight, dense columns below it and the news these columns contain from across the channel. Let's imagine ourselves to be one of those serving wenches or pint-pot boys. Are we in the pay of the Attorney General? Or are we just curious about what these three men are murmuring? I'll leave that up to you. But either way, we have to get close. It's hard to hear what Physician James, Bookseller John, and chemist's shopman George are saying. Episode 3. The Pint Pot Paperweights. <laughs> Physician James, bookseller John, and chemist shopman George, secreted in a corner nook of their regular Shoreditch tavern, are keeping their voices low. Their wigged heads converge in whispers over a pile of news sheets with pint pots of porter for paperweights. The three men's greying locks poke out from beneath their wigs. It's becoming harder to distinguish their hair from the horsehair. Hair may be growing longer from their ears, but these men still have plenty up top. These are no young firebrands, but sober men in their prime. We've brought a jug of porter to top up their paperweights. Let's see if we can linger and earwig on their whispered conversation unnoticed. John and George, founders of the London Corresponding Society, are of similar age to James, yet they both appear to defer to the physician. Had we been one of the Attorney General's spies, we might have reported the arrival of the local physician as one of their first recruits. Noting that James seems to have swiftly won their trust might have earned us an extra penny. Let's cock an ear. Maybe we can pick up what James is saying to his friends. It's been a year since France declared war on us, whispers the physician. For the moment, the revolutionaries seem to care more for cutting off their own heads than ours. But when they finish their own bloodletting, continues James, his voice now rising, they'll surely come for us. If Our government refuses our pleas for reform, just as surely Madame Guillotine will make her London debut. We've now found our own nook behind a curtain. When we peek out, we can observe differences in the manner of James's two partners. The Attorney General pays extra for these kinds of details. George Higgins, the chemist's shopman, looks nervous. He spends more time looking over his shoulders than looking earnestly at his friends. John Smith, the bookseller, by contrast, appears relaxed. John seems as amused at George's alarm as George is alarmed at the volume of James's speaking voice as he readily imparts information. The bookseller remarks laconically, Higgins, if you persist in looking over each shoulder thrice a minute, your head will remove itself without the intervention of Madame Guillotine. Look better keep your voice down, Parkinson, continues the bookseller, affably. Or you may find our friend in your waiting room tomorrow morning, with a twisted spine. George is not amused. How can you be so reckless? Your loose tongue risks losing your neck and ours. 
How many of our friends must be arrested, imprisoned, and falsely charged with conspiracy, sedition, and treason before you learn caution? The bookseller smiles broadly, but now speaks more softly. Whether in pamphlets or in taverns, moderation of tone is no guarantee of protection from the Attorney General's paranoia. Everyone knows the capital's coffee shops and taverns are infested with John Scott's undercover agents. No one knows who to trust. After all, loitering in our nook behind our curtain, we could be one of them. Their conversation resumes. Bookseller John has recently taken a huge risk. He agreed to sell the first political tract written by his new physician friend. Persuading the printer to take the job took weeks. In the end, he'd only agreed to risk it if James agreed to publish under a pseudonym. Such subterfuge offended James's instinct for transparency, but he'd reluctantly agreed. They picked a pen name, Old Hubert, and gave his pamphlet the title Pearls Cast Before Swine by Edmund Burke and Scraped Together by Old Hubert. It contains passionate appeals for urgent reform to avoid the blood being shed across the channel. Old Hubert immediately exasperated the publisher and cautious George Higgins by using his real name in several advertisements for his pamphlet published in The Times. Now George seems to be hissing a warning to his friends not to play with fire. Let's sidle over to refresh their paperweights. Maybe we can catch the bookseller's reaction. Calm yourself, George, says John. We've been meeting here for months now, with no hint of a leak or whiff of betrayal. Proceed, good physician, with your diagnosis. Where will this all end? Two sets of eyes and ears three, including ours, now turn to the physician. Here's what I've read, says James, calm, considered, starting in a low tone. Last January, the Place de la Révolution was ringing with cheers as, according to the more lurid reports, the Sun King's head was separated from his spouting neck before it toppled into the basket beneath the guillotine. The two listening wigged heads lean in. Let's risk another step closer to catch what James says next. Now, the secret Paris source of the Times of London informs us that a mere 18 months later, the Place de la Révolution is a place of muted murmur, as their new emperor, Robespierre, meets the same fate as the Sun King. George interjects. Some say Rospierre faced Madame Guillotine face up. Hush, George, says John. The London Corresponding Society deals in fact, not rumour. Let the physician get to his prognosis. The physician continues. Here's what I have observed. For the past five years, regardless of their malady or their character, my patients have spoken of little other than revolution. Some fear it, some welcome it. The Huguenot silk merchants and the poor weavers who work for them hold different cards in their hands and different views in their heads. A step back now, as the physician's voice rises. That's why we must convince our government that their survival, our survival, the survival of our society, our empire, our crown, the survival of everything that we value hinges on abandoning their fear of reform as a threat and embracing reform as our saviour. If we can't turn the heads of our prime minister and attorney general by means of reason, I fear it won't be long before they lose them to Madame Guillotine. George whispers, exasperated, For God's sake, James, keep your voice down! Three heads now turn to us, caught eavesdropping. We retire and hear no more of their whispered conversation. Episode 4 The View from Westminster. <laughs> Let's
Let's leave the huddled wigs of our three concerned citizens. Let's leave the Shoreditch Tavern and rise above the world of James Parkinson and his patients, John Smith and his books, George Higgins and his, well, whatever concerns a chemist's shopman. Let's swoop above the clattering hovels of the weavers of Hoxton. Let's escape the malodorous fumes oozing from the furniture workshops of Hackney. Soaring higher in the shadowy side streets of the multiplying theatres of Shoreditch, we glimpse the ladies of the night as they pursue their trade. Inside the theatres, actors, famous and infamous, perform for the feathers and cummerbunds of the capital's fashionable set. But our sights are set even higher. Let's head south to the river and follow the twinkling lights of the ferryboats and barges upstream until we spy the Palace of Westminster. Let's alight at the pinnacle of Parliament, the apex of the establishment, no less a perch than the private chamber of the Prime Minister himself, William Pitt the Younger. If we peek in his window, what do we see? Pitt sits by a fire, whose flickering flames illuminate deepening lines on his face. He sips a glass of brandy and reads a pamphlet. They call him Pitt the Younger to distinguish him from his father and predecessor as Prime Minister, Pitt the Older. Pitt the Younger is still only thirty-five, but starting to look older. With the king bouncing between sanity and, and the opposite, with every bout of his monarch's malady, the fate of the nation weighs heavier on Pitt's shoulders. What a time to have a weak king! By the time George III has appointed his second Pitt as Prime Minister, revolution has already cut adrift Britain's American colonies. Will Pitt the Younger be remembered as the man at the helm when England herself is sunk by its own Jacobin revolutionaries? What course can the Prime Minister steer. John Scott, his Attorney General and Spymaster, keeps bringing him reports of the plots of those chattering artisan classes. In meetings, Scott brandishes the pamphlets they publish under bizarre names, warning of their efforts to sway the masses with their upstart nonsense. Pitt has one such pamphlet open on his lap by someone calling themselves Old Hubert. Pitt said nothing at their morning meeting when the Attorney General, puce with outrage, had thrust it across the table at him. A knock at the door and speak of the devil. The servant's announcement dies on his lips as the Attorney General himself barges past him. Scott waits to hear the door click shut and gives his Prime Minister a perfunctory bow. For months now, John Scott, the most senior lawyer in the land, the spider at the center of his web of spies and informers, has been bringing Pitt reports of plots and conspiracies. This Attorney General doesn't see his job as merely executing the law. John Scott has a higher purpose, resisting revolution at any cost. As his Prime Minister, a lawyer himself, likes to dryly remark, Scott has proved himself to be as capable of making up laws as of making them. Scott retorts that if he does so, it's only because he feels the nation is in peril, which these days is all the time. These two men, now at the peak of the establishment, arrived there via very different routes. Pitt was born into power and privilege. Scott was not. As an apprentice to a coal broker in Newcastle, young John Scott was impetuous and rebellious. He defied the wishes of not one but two families when he eloped with his heiress sweetheart Bessie by means of a close friend, a ladder, and a midnight flit. But that was 22 years ago. Now 56, Scott is a barrister at the top of his profession, ennobled just elected to the Royal Society, Scott has taken to the establishment like, well, like a coal broker to coal. Any empathy Scott may once have felt for his fellow Geordie workers is long extinguished. 
This Attorney General has become as crusty and stubbornly inflexible as the most adhesive and beribboned barnacle of the landed gentry. And this tribe is up in arms. In the House of Lords, dukes and earls robed in ermine are baying for an iron fist. In the House of Commons, those with lesser titles from the rotten boroughs are calling for blood. Britain's landed gentry is urging their Attorney General to show no mercy in his campaign of violent repression against any hint of sedition. No mercy has he shown. Pitt has become used to his Attorney General's urgent late-night visits to his private chambers. The Prime Minister asks Scott what news he brings this time that couldn't wait until morning. He shows no surprise as Scott delivers it. The Jacobins continue their filthy work unabated, Prime Minister, intones the Attorney General, adopting his courtroom stance. They spread their poison, skulking in the capital's taverns and coffee houses. I am, however, pleased, I will never say happy, I am pleased to report that my efforts to infiltrate the London Corresponding Society have finally brought success. The Prime Minister raises his eyebrows and leaves a brief pause before he speaks. At last, Attorney General, he says, maybe your web of spies, sneaks and squealers has finally come up with something tangible. Let's hope, for your sake, if not for the nation's, that any prosecution proves more successful than your attempts last year to crush that lot of seditious Scots in Edinburgh. Scott winces at this sly barb. A few months before, the Scottish courts had thwarted the Attorney General's plans to focus minds in the north of the Union by means of some judicious hanging. Judicious, maybe, but judicial, no, ruled the Scottish judges, and Scott's case collapsed. Those silky-tongued barristers can twist any truth into lies. The Attorney General rises to the Prime Minister's bait as obligingly as a trout in one of Pitt's chalk-stream rivers at home in Wiltshire. Attorney General, chides Pitt, you appear to forget that you are just such a barrister. Indeed, are you not the general of all attorneys? Is your tongue not as silky, your twisting as dexterous as any in the Union? Touché, Prime Minister, scowled Scott. A nice point, nicely won, by a lethal courtroom swordsman. Our profession's loss has indeed been our government's gain. An idea now appears to occur to the Attorney General. Indeed, Prime Minister, should you wish, you may have the opportunity to practice your courtroom skewering in the Privy Council, no less, in the prosecution of the very matter of which I speak. The Attorney General's frown disappears and is replaced by a sly smirk. If you have so little faith in my ability to send these traitors to the Tower, he continues, why not lead the cross-examination yourself to ensure they suffer just retribution for their crimes? Wary of flattery, the Prime Minister betrays no enthusiasm at the prospect of resuming his legal career. Undaunted, the Attorney General continues to lay it on with a trowel. The Prime Minister's wit, guile and reason will ensure that when these treacherous scum leave the court, they'll soon feel some British rope around their necks. If Scott hoped this would rouse his Prime Minister into righteous fury, he's disappointed. His ruse provokes no more than a wry smile. Your language has become coarse of late, Attorney General, says Pitt. I fear you're too long in the company of your gutter-scuttling squealers. Surely even your ingenious interpretation of our laws can't stretch to beheading timorous pamphleteers and reforming speechmakers. When rehearsing his revelation on the way up to the Prime Minister's chambers, Scott imagined a better reception, but the Attorney General had yet to play his trump card. Maybe not, Prime Minister, 
he paused, a grim grin on his lips, before delivering his coup de grace. But would you be so lenient with traitors from the London Corresponding Society if you knew they plot to assassinate the king? Episode 5 The Plot When receiving the Attorney General's reports from his spy network, the Prime Minister's usual practice was to keep his face straight and his tone neutral. Though only 35, it would be hard to find a more urbane, experienced, road-tested man in England than Pitt the Younger. Born and bred in politics, Prime Ministerial son of a Prime Minister, star barrister in London's law courts, Pitt was a hard man to surprise, let alone shock. But, as his Attorney General revealed details of the plot to assassinate the king he'd just uncovered, the Prime Minister's habitual composure deserted him. His grip on the pamphlet he'd been reading loosened. As he leaned forward, it slid off his lap, unnoticed, to the floor. A new revelation provokes an involuntary gesture, knocking the glass of brandy to the floor. This, too, is left unattended. The prime ministerial mouth, usually fixed in a curve of wry amusement, now forms the shape of the top of an empty pint pot. No surprise, as what the Attorney General is describing is, for Pitt, a literal waking nightmare. The threat of revolution occupies most of Pitt's waking hours and stalks many of his sleeping ones. The threat of revolt, like the constant challenge presented by his king's occasional detachments from reality, are what is aging Pitt the Younger so rapidly. Despite his urbane manner, the Prime Minister takes his responsibility to steer Britain from imminent disaster very seriously. One of Pitt's few pleasures has been to tease his dour northerner Attorney General about what he calls Scott's eavesdropper army. Despite all the time and effort Scott invests in it, his clandestine network of street hawkers, shopkeepers and tavern staff has yet to justify any confidence, let alone its considerable expense. But it has now exposed a stunning act of treason. One of John Scott's moles has blown the cover on a plot to assassinate King George III. So... What was the audacious, bizarre plot that had sent the pamphlet to the floor, upset the brandy glass, and turned Pitt's tight lips into a capital O? First, a homemade blowpipe was to be secretly manufactured to deliver a poison dart in a crowded theatre. An assassin would get close enough that when the king stood to applaud or be applauded, this blowgun could be deployed to deliver its lethal dart. This, says Scott's Mole, is designed to trigger a coordinated uprising throughout the city. The king's assassination will trigger a secret network of agitators to uncover hidden caches of pitchforks and other sharp pointy weapons concealed around the capital. They'd arm the masses and urge them to revolt. The violent mob, bristling with sharp, pointy weapons, will storm Parliament, topple the government, install a tyrannous dictator, and so on and so forth. If this bombshell left Britain's laconic Prime Minister with his mouth agape, just imagine what the nation's press made of it. In 1794, competing newspapers chased sales just as much as they do today, and they went to town on this story. They quickly dubbed it the Pop Gun Plot. Its gory and sensational details, leaked by the Attorney General, dominated front pages for months. Just check any 18th century newspaper archive. The Attorney General is delighted. His network of spies has finally come up with the goods. He quickly arrests the plot's main ringleaders. 
A couple are tipped off and slip away, but he's confident it won't be long before they join their co-conspirators in the Tower of London. The popgun plotters fester there in chains, awaiting the kind of trial he'd long hoped would focus the public's minds on the dangers of giving an inch to the reformers. The pop-gun plot displaces stories of the French Revolution from the front pages of the news sheets. They now carry screeds of patriotic outrage, rallying a wobbly nation against weak-willed notions of reform. The degree of public interest is hardly surprising. The details are literally incredible, beyond bonkers. And, in case you were wondering where this is all going... The revolutionary perpetrators of the pop gun plot were the London Corresponding Society. Let's now try to tease out the facts of the matter. So far, our stories hopped between James's home and surgery in Hoxton Square, the Shoreditch Tavern meeting place of the London Corresponding Society, and the Prime Minister's private chamber at the Palace of Westminster. Now, like the Attorney General's spy network, our story spreads. It forms a complex web linking all levels of London society and all types of people. The pop-gun plot has its origins in an awkward little problem for the London Corresponding Society. It starts when reliable witnesses inform the society's leaders that one of their number, a watchmaker by the name of Thomas Upton, has fallen into debt. To pay off his creditors, they say, Upton has deliberately burnt down his house and claimed the insurance. Thomas Upton, they say, is a fraud and a liar. They say it's the duty of the society to expel him and expose him as a gambler, a fraudster, an arsonist, and a liar. Now, this delivers justice, but it also protects their own under-suspicion society from guilt by association. Reformers have to stay squeaky clean, and Upton was a filthy mess. For this task, the society needs to entrust the delicate role of investigating this matter to someone of unimpeachable probity. The society convenes to decide how to proceed. Bookseller John Smith chemists shopman George Higgins and other founders turned to the society's most honest and reliable member, James Parkinson, physician of Number 1 Hoxton Square, agrees to take on this solemn and heavy responsibility and starts making discreet inquiries. Before long, Upton feels trapped. If his criminality is proved, Upton faces certain humiliation. Lifelong disgrace, imprisonment, bankruptcy. It's at this point that Upton drops his bombshell. Before the London Corresponding Society makes any move to eject him, the watchmaker reveals to government spies that he's come across a treacherous plot to assassinate the king, a plot hatched by his London Corresponding Society colleagues. The details are astonishing. Upton tells the Attorney General that the London Corresponding Society has secretly commissioned him and another skilled metal worker to manufacture a blowpipe. It must be designed to be smuggled into a theatre attended by the King and capable of delivering a poisoned dart. Imagine Abraham Lincoln's theatre assassination, but 150 years earlier, and using a poisoned dart, and on the other side of the Atlantic, and... Oh, yes. Completely fabricated. But it's in the nature of humans, even powerful ones, especially powerful ones, to open their ears to lies they want to hear and close them to inconvenient truths. The pop-gun plot was precisely the kind of fake news John Scott's eavesdropper army knew the Attorney General was looking for. The sensational pop-gun plot justifies all the Attorney General's dark warnings to Prime Minister Pitt the Younger. Upton names the traitors behind the plot, the leaders of the London Corresponding Society who were about to kick him out, including the bookseller John Smith and chemist shopman George Higgins. John Scott, the former coal broker's apprentice, 
throws the accused plotters into the dungeons of the Tower of London. He then sets a date for their trial for high treason, a capital offence, in the Privy Council, the highest court in the land. By the time of the trial, one plotter remains on the run, hunted down by the Attorney General's army of eavesdroppers. But this fugitive is not the honest, reliable member deputed to investigate Thomas Upton, the whistleblower whose revelation set the whole trial in motion. The lives of John Smith and George Higgins hang by a thread while the hangman prepares his noose to finish the job. But, absent from Thomas Upton's list of accused plotters, is the name of the person deputed to investigate him. Who knows why Thomas Upton didn't include this name on his blacklist of accused plotters. Maybe it's because he wasn't a founder member, just an early recruit. But the physician, James Parkinson, my hero's hero, remains at liberty, unindicted, a free man at number one Hoxton Square. Episode 6, The Physician's Dilemma. It's well past midnight, but the lights are still on at number one, Hoxton Square. Overlooking the square, upstairs in the family quarters, James paces the length of his drawing room. Watching him is his wife Mary, nursing their new baby. At her side, their eldest, nine-year-old John, looks on, serious and worried. Six-year-old Emma, slightly less so, as she plays with the boisterously oblivious three-year-old Henry. Henry and the baby are the only ones who appear impervious to the tension in the room, as James paces back and forth, up and down. James weighs his options over and over again, sometimes muttering to himself, sometimes addressing his wife. Mary, baby at her breast, says little, but follows her husband's every move, listens to his every word as he seeks a way out of his living nightmare. The more he examines his options, the more intractable James's plight appears. His dilemma becomes worse every time he repeats his analysis. Mary listens in silence as James states it for the hundredth time. If I stand by my friends, says James, I'll be sent to the gallows with them abandoning you and all our children to a life of penury. If I abandon my friends, I'll be tortured by guilt for every hour of my remaining years. The anxious look on the face of his oldest child, John, named after James's father, suggests a sensitivity beyond his nine years. John survived the fever and cholera epidemics that deprived him of two siblings. They lie buried in the churchyard at St. Leonard's, whose moonlit spire is visible from the drawing-room window. As the spire is periodically eclipsed by the pacing James, John tries to recall his father's explanation of why these epidemics are now so common in London. Every day, more country folk squeeze into our narrow streets, James had told him, streets which are still strangers to sewers and sanitation. Young John fears the invisible assassins that killed his siblings, but he wants to understand them. The boy tries again to recall James's attempts to explain current epidemiological theories in terms a nine-year-old boy might understand. What Londoners call the Great Stink, James told him, some physicians are starting to call miasmas. They suspect London's increasingly foul air must somehow account for the rising cholera deaths, but don't understand how. Sometimes, he explains, you just don't know. And it's better to know that you don't know than to make things up. Just 
observe and listen. Make an effort to work it out and look for practical solutions, even if you don't have a perfect understanding of the hows and the whys. John wrinkles his nose as he catches a whiff of the great stink, as everyone calls it. Even in relatively open, airy spaces like Hoxton Square, you can never escape the great stink. Right now, it's wafting in through the drawing room windows, but his father pays no heed. James has far more pressing things on his mind, like the imminent trial for treason of his closest friends. With a nod from his mother, John, displaying his father's tact and empathy, tells his little sister and little brother to say goodnight. He takes one in each hand and leads them upstairs to bed so as not to disturb father. James barely notices as they leave the room. He turns for another length of the drawing room carpet, pausing to look out over Hoxton Square. It's deserted. He poses to no one in particular the same question he's been asking himself, his wife, and his friends ever since he heard the Attorney General had flung his friends into the tower. What am I to do? Like all the London corresponding society leaders who are neither imprisoned awaiting trial for treason nor on the run to avoid that fate, Mary has no answer. All she can come up with on this occasion is... Don't fret so, my love. Her words sound as empty as all the other such blandishments and reassurances James has heard and ignored over the past few weeks. His friends are now hours away from their trial at the Privy Council. As some of the more reformed-minded newspapers have been pointing out, the charges remain as ludicrous and evidence-free as the day John Smith and George Higgins were arrested but it's the latest headlines that have thrown James into despair. The Attorney General has persuaded the Prime Minister himself, Pitt the Younger, to lead the prosecution. What am I to do, James repeats for the thousandth time today, this time directly addressing his wife. Mary says nothing. If none of the newspapers, none of the eminent members of the London Corresponding Society, none of the supporters of reform in Parliament can come up with an answer, how can she? Mary can only try to calm her husband and trust his efforts to apply his formidable intellect and moral judgment to this impossible dilemma. God will show you the way, she murmurs this time. Mary Dale married James 13 years ago. Her father, one of the many silk makers living in Hoxton Square, knew and respected their local apothecary surgeon, John Parkinson, and grew to admire his physician, son, James. The virtues James displayed in gaining these titles convinced Mary's father he would make a fine husband for Mary, and so he has. James inherited his father's merits of hard work, devotion to his patients, whether rich or poor, and love of books and discovery. The Dales shared John's pride as his son's career matched and surpassed his father's. By the time we find him pacing in his Hoxton Square living room past midnight, James is making inroads into society. And not just as secretary of the London Corresponding Society, he's known to a growing circle of eminent gentlemen who share James's fascination with fossils and the emerging fields of scientific inquiry they're still calling natural history. As the clock chimes 2 a.m., the only fossils on James's mind are the lords, dukes, and earls who are to form his friend's jury in the Privy Council trial that starts in nine hours' time. James resumes his pacing, his anguish unabated, wearing a path in the drawing room carpet as he tries to think his way out of his terrible dilemma. Mary occasionally murmurs platitudes, as much to calm the baby and herself as her husband. She looks down at their newborn baby girl, named Mary, after her. She's asleep. Glancing through the window, Mary glimpses the moonlit spire of St. Leonard's and tries not to think of her first-born boy, John, and third-born, Jane, lying in its churchyard. 
the St. Leonard's clock strikes five. The day of his friend's trial is about to dawn. Still, James paces, racked by conflicting loyalty to his friends, his principles, and his family. His dilemma is every revolutionary's dilemma. Do his duties lie first with preservation of his own life, his own principles, or the fate of his family? The first tendrils of dawn accelerate James's pacing. James turns to Mary. He folds his arms as if to discipline his thoughts. He takes a deep breath, tries once again as a man of science to describe his dilemma objectively. The Attorney General has elected not to send me to the Tower with my innocent friends, he says to his wife. But in truth, he may as well have condemned me to the torture chamber for the rest of my days. The papers say the Prime Minister himself will prosecute the case in the Privy Council. This suggests they have no intention of seeking justice and seek only scapegoats. James's attempt at objectivity fails as he flings his arms in the air. But it makes no sense. Why does he not indict me too? He asks his wife. Is Pitt so exquisitely tortuous that he knows that to spare me is to condemn me to a life of painful guilt? Logic and the law surely dictate that I must be every bit as guilty or innocent as my friends. Yet Pitt condemns me to freedom while my friends shiver in the tower. It makes no sense. Why? Faced with this rhetorical question, Mary looks at her husband, hopelessly, as he stands, arms aloft, hands on head, a statue of despair. She attempts another blandishment. Maybe he fears facing you in court, my love. Keeping his eyes on his wife's lips, James now slowly lowers his arms and slowly nods as if to himself. James crosses his arms, walks over to the window, and gazes across Hoxton Square. No more pacing. James now stands with his hands clasped behind his back, suddenly deep in thought. Episode 7 The Privy Council Just before the start of his friend's trial for high treason at the Privy Council, James astounds everyone. He volunteers to give evidence. This sensational development sends the Privy Council, the highest court in the land, into turmoil. Courts are used to dragging witnesses onto the witness stand. There's no routine procedure for having a witness knock on the door and demand the right to speak. News sheet reporters are already gathering on the streets outside the Privy Council when they first hear a rumour that the Secretary of the London Corresponding Society, that modest physician of rather below middle stature, has requested to be cross-examined. When word gets out James had volunteered his testimony to save the accused from the noose and not to tighten it around their necks, a commotion starts. Reporters form tight knots to try to work out what this bolt from the blue might mean. With the arrival of every earl, duke or lord who will form the jury, the huddles of hacks disperse. They swarm around the new arrival, quizzing him as he runs the gauntlet from chaotic carriage to the sanctuary of the court. Once the earls, dukes and lords reach this refuge and are insulated from the swinish multitude, They form identical huddles, asking each other identical questions. Why has this man volunteered to give evidence? Why is he risking his own life? 
Both huddles, hacks and nobles, break up at the arrival of the prosecuting counsel, the Prime Minister William Pitt, and his deputy, the Attorney General John Scott. These eminent legal minds disappear into their chamber to plot their interrogation of the new witness. The huddles reform, the speculation grows. The greatest commotion erupts at the arrival on foot of the new volunteer witness. Here comes the physician, James Parkinson, of Number 1 Hoxton Square. Here comes the secretary of the London Corresponding Society, the secret club of revolutionaries behind the pop-gun plot to assassinate the king, according to whistleblower Thomas Upton, the watchmaker. Armed with no more than his sense of justice, his clarity of mind and personal integrity, James chooses to enter this bastion of an insecure, paranoid, and bloodthirsty establishment. Eventually, behind schedule, the Privy Council trial is about to start. The atmosphere in court is hostile. It seethes with suspicion and deceit. Pitt scribbles notes with one hand as he adjusts his barrister's robes with the other. The Attorney General whispers last-minute stratagems into his ear. We needn't speculate on what these two men said in private. What they said in public is a matter of public record. Before we hear the actual words verbatim, the climax of that hearing, here's the skeleton of the Attorney General's cross-examination strategy that he's now hissing into the Prime Ministerial ear. First, throw James off balance. Make him swear on the Bible. Lure him into incriminating himself. Next, demand that he reveals the whereabouts of the fugitive accused conspirator still on the run. Then, an arsenal of other traps, such as tricking him into admitting authorship of an unpublished pamphlet to build a trapdoor of circumstantial evidence that will leave him swinging from the gibbet with the co-conspirators he calls his friends. There can be no more formidable prosecution team than the Prime Minister and the Attorney General. But what hope of the jury? Not all the earls, dukes, and lords present share the Attorney General's thirst for violent repression, but most do. Even those who don't wouldn't hesitate to send this foolhardy physician to join the accused on the gallows if they thought James was a traitor. So, James starts the trial with his life hanging by a thread. He's volunteered to put his head in the noose. James takes the stand. Every word you now hear from him and from Pitt is taken from a verbatim account James wrote shortly after the trial ended, using recall techniques he taught himself during his medical studies. Official court records exist, but they're so clearly inferior, no biographer or historian even bothers to quote from them. Two centuries later, they remain moldy and undigitized, in the archives of the National Records Office in Kew. By contrast, Parkinson's own account has become the centerpiece of a colourful account of the pop-gun plot by one of the accused that's long been a bestseller among late 18th-century history buffs. If you're among them, you'll have one of the dozens of facsimile editions reprinted by university presses around the world. Back to the Privy Council. It's just been called to session. The earls, dukes and lords fall silent as Prime Minister Pitt, now Chief Prosecutor Pitt, rises to his feet, adjusts his robes one last time and sets the first of the Attorney General's traps. Take the oath, he challenges James. In response, James asks permission to leave certain questions put to him unanswered. I'll happily demolish Upton's flimsy allegations, says the physician, but to do so truthfully might incriminate my friends or myself in respect to other activities. Activities which, once acceptable, the Attorney General had recently branded illegal. Pitt senses weakness 
and goes for a quick kill. Here's the transcript, the words now coming to you directly from the 1794 Privy Council trial. William Pitt You are here to answer certain questions respecting matters of the highest importance to the state, in which any reservation on your part will, at least, be highly improper. John Scott Consider, sir, you are now before the highest court in this kingdom. Now James Parkinson If I thought your lordships would confine your interrogatories to the business of the pretended plot, I should be ready to take the oath directly. William Pitt now sees an opening. Then I will tell you, Mr. Parkinson, that the business on which you were required to attend is that of Mr. Upton's. But your own good sense will tell you that in the performance of our duty, we cannot engage to confine our questions to any specific matter, since that may arise in your answers which may render it necessary to put such questions as may not appear to apply immediately to that business. James Parkinson concedes, but having somehow changed the tone of the discussion from confrontational to collegial. Well, my lords, as it is on the business of Upton on which I am to be examined, I am ready to take the oath, your lordships allowing me to object to certain questions. At this point, I, I, very well, very well, was heard from every part of the table. John Scott now concedes, you will not be asked to criminate yourself. James Parkinson takes his concession and now raises the stakes. There is no question you can put, he says, which can produce an answer to criminate me. James now takes the oath. His frank and sincere manner has started to win over the more reasonable elements of the jury of earls, dukes, and lords. James has withdrawn his head ever so slightly from the noose. James now puts the Prime Minister on the back foot. He suggests it would simplify matters if he were to read out an uninterrupted account of all that he knows regarding the accusations against his friends. After that, says James, their lordships could question him. From any other witness, this might have seemed provocative or insolent. Pitt, however, maybe starting to read the room, agrees. James's account proves so reasonable, so sober, so evidently true and honest, that Pitt and Scott struggle to pick any holes in it and gradually give up trying they start to sense their efforts to discredit the witness are not going down well with the jury. The Attorney General removes the safety catch from one of his booby traps he's prepared for James and hands it to Pitt to deploy. Pitt asks James to reveal the hiding place of the fugitive co-conspirator, also accused of high treason, who disappeared when he heard Smith and Higgins had been arrested. James protests, saying he's come to exonerate the innocent, not give them up to false charges. Pitt says he must answer or incriminate himself. Having set this catch-22 trap for James to step into, Pitt rests his case. But James now turns the tables on the Prime Minister. It's a high-risk strategy as it implicates the quasi-legal machinations of the Attorney General at his side. James's reply, verbatim. My lords, my legal knowledge is but very trifling. It chiefly consists in knowing what was crime a few years ago. But from the extraordinary circumstances I have lately observed, I know not what may be now deemed crime or not. On that ground, also, I object to answering this question. Stalemate One by one, Pitt has lobbed the Attorney General's legal grenades. One by one, James has exposed and diffused them. Accusatory frowns 
on aristocratic brows turn into raised eyebrows. The prosecution's strategy of attacking a patently honest man is crumbling before their eyes. Blow by blow, quietly, comprehensively, James demolishes the Crown's case. With each frank and sincere answer, James exposes Thomas Upton's fabrications as being more ludicrous and himself more trustworthy. With each skirmish, the Attorney General's suspicions look more hysterical and paranoid, Pitt's probing more petty, and the probity of his friends in the dock more evident. Eventually, the prosecution realises the more they attack the physician, the more they damage their own case. As a lawyer, Pitt knows he's met his match. As a gentleman, Pitt recognises James's decency, and as a politician, Pitt twigs the tide has turned. Now, the Hollywood version of this courtroom drama would result in immediate and total vindication. The jury of nobles would stamp their feet in a thunderous volley of applause. In a stunning moment of redemption, Pitt the Younger would proffer a sporting handshake. Maybe even the Attorney General would be shamed into a grudging bow. James and his friends would leave the court borne aloft on the shoulders of their cheering fellow correspondents, free men all. We'd all be in tears, along with the earls, dukes, and lords. Now, by all means, hit pause now, if you prefer this end to the story. We'd all understand why. Episode 8 a different kind of activism. <laughs> Life and the British justice system are a bit messier than Hollywood scripts. After James volunteered his testimony to the Privy Council, John Smith the bookseller, George Higgins the chemist shopman, and their London Corresponding Society co-accused remained in the Tower of London for months. But the physician from Hoxton's testimony in this trial turned public opinion. Eventually, all charges were dropped and his friends were released from the Tower as free men, and, well, now you can imagine whatever Hollywood moment you like. If you like real reality, if you're okay with nuance, would you like to know what actually happened when James left the Privy Council courtroom that day? In its way, it's just as remarkable as the movie version. It certainly tells us a lot about Jimmy P., the physician of Hoxton. On the day of the trial, after talking his way out of a noose and politely defying the combined firepower of the Prime Minister and Attorney General, James leaves the court and steps out into the street. There, he's confronted by the mother of one of his patients. Ignoring the baying journalists, he takes the distraught Margaret Davis aside. He asks why she's so upset and listens carefully to what she says. Margaret tells him she's come to the court in desperation to seek his urgent help. Her son, George, who has what we now call mental health issues, is one of James's patients at the Hoxton Lunatic Asylum. James is a frequent visitor there. Unlike the rest of his profession, he feels compassion for its occupants. In 1794, a lunatic asylum is still seen more as a place of public entertainment than a sanatorium. James is among the first to treat asylum inmates with dignity, as patients with treatable maladies. He addresses them normally. He listens carefully. He takes detailed histories. He treats them as people, not subhumans. Outside the courtroom, between sobs, Margaret tells James that a few days ago, 
friends got George discharged from the asylum. They went out drinking, where they abandoned George to the predations of an army recruiting party who had taken advantage of her son's mental derangement to press-gang him. That was the last anyone had seen of George. James immediately drops everything to track down George Davis. After several days sleuthing and searching, James discovers George at an army training camp in Hemel Hempstead. He finds George in a terrible mental and physical state, but the army thinks George is faking distress in order to get discharged. James tries and tries again to convince the army to release his patient. Days later, he's told George has died in army custody. This is the first recorded incident of what was to become one of James's many lifelong passions, the better treatment of the mentally ill. So far as we know, James never wrote of his emotional state after the Privy Council trial, but it's not hard for us to imagine. Despite his intervention, his friends are still in the Tower of London. Their fates remain in the balance as the courts and news sheets vie with their lives. James has just endured the tragedy of George Davis's press-ganging and death in custody. James could hardly have done anything more. Maybe that's what Mary tells him. Maybe she encourages him to return to the daily routine of attending to the patients in his waiting room at number one Hoxton Square, to keep giving the same attention to those in silk sitting in the armchairs as to those in rags on the wooden benches. Maybe James needs no encouragement to focus on his fossil collection. Maybe he improves the design of a surgical truss he's invented to alleviate the hernia injuries sustained by his laborer patients. His more money-minded friends are urging James to patent his truss. It could make him an independently wealthy gentleman with no need to see patients again. Instead, James publishes his design for free so anyone could make them and benefit from his invention. Maybe James looks at his young family and reflects on how they'd cope without him to provide for them. This is all speculation, but what we do know is that after the Privy Council trial, James abandons politics. He publishes no more pamphlets on the subject of political reform. Instead, James devotes himself to less dangerous topics, an astonishing variety of them, in fact. Over the next 30 years, James publishes dozens of papers, including seminal works in geology, paleontology, care for the mentally ill, and medicine. Among them, a 65-page treatise, an essay on the shaking palsy, the one that barely causes a ripple, when it's published in 1817. Seven years later, James dies on the winter solstice of 1824. He was mourned in the parish, respected by his peers in the sciences. The poor and needy of Hoxton continue to remember him fondly as they're treated by his son, John, who takes over the family practice. Years pass, The Industrial Revolution blasts on full steam ahead. Britain's empire spreads. People die. Memories fade. As the decades pass, many of the reforms James sought as a younger man come to pass. Meanwhile, with the passing of every person who's known him, the name of James Parkinson fades, wanes, ebbs dissolves, evaporates. So, why do I claim you've all heard of him? Sixty-three years after James Parkinson had been buried in St. Leonard's churchyard, sixty-three years after he's laid to rest beside his infant children, a Parisian physician stumbles across that 1817 essay on the shaking palsy. 
Jean-Martin Charcot, the founder of the modern science of neurology, reads James's 1817 pamphlet again and again. He starts circulating copies to colleagues. Charcot was the first of many to be astonished at this modest physician's powers of observation and deduction. To honor James posthumously, Charcot introduces the eponym, Parkinson's disease. It was widely used in Europe before it became common in Britain. After years of warning against the revolutionary dangers gusting over the channel, James might have been amused that his resurrection originated in Paris. But most of all, I imagine James Parkinson, Jimmy P, would have been astonished to learn that of all his life's achievements, the one for which he's remembered two centuries later is his little pamphlet on what he called the shaking palsy. Our story today of the quiet heroism of this modest physician in revolutionary times is long forgotten. That's why I want to tell it. But we all know about what my dad always used to call this cruel disease. We now know that Parkinson's disease afflicts one in every 500 people. If you're wondering why such a common disease went unnamed for so long, consider the complexity of its presentation. Parkinson's has a wide variety of symptoms, each of which affects every individual differently. Huge strides have been made in understanding the mechanism of Parkinson's disease, but even today, its cause and its cure elude medical science. So, how did this modest Hoxton physician, with only the technology and medical understanding of the early 1800s to guide him, spot this shape-shifting collection of symptoms? How could he work out that they might be linked and share a single root cause, something that eluded doctors for decades after his death? James Parkinson spotted this because of his extraordinary powers of compassion, empathy, observation, and listening. His essay on the shaking palsy has become a classic of medical literature. Read it, and you'll be even more amazed. He described this complex disease with such uncanny accuracy based on only six cases. Three he read about. Two he examined himself, and one was a nameless stranger he spotted once. One day, looking from his study to the other side of Hoxton Square, James's sharp eye caught a distinctive shuffling gait. The man slowly disappeared from James's sight, swallowed up by London. James never saw the man again, never knew his name, but he knew what he'd seen. He made a note, described what he saw, and later connected it to his other observations. The rest, as you now know, is medical history. So, there you have it. The story of Jimmy P., my hero's hero, James Parkinson. Just as Jimmy P. collected and assembled all his pieces of evidence for the shaking palsy, my father spent his life assembling all the little clues and crumbs and components of the story you've just heard from all sorts of different sources. This, then, is the trove I found in the papers in Dad's study after he died. The bizarre tale of the heroic role played in a plot to assassinate the king by someone you've all heard of is my homage to my hero via his hero. Parts of it are familiar to some specialists in medical and 18th century history, but it's a barely told story, which is why I wanted to tell it to you. Now, there's one more story I think you'd like now you know Jimmy P. It too reaches out beyond the grave, but this one is even less well known, and, in its own way, just as remarkable. Put it this way, I reckon Jimmy P. would have loved it. Episode 9 A Tale of Two Wheezes. (laughs) 
So there you have it. If you know about or have had the misfortune to come across what my father used to call this cruel disease, you now know the forgotten history of the man behind the eponymous malady, James Parkinson, physician of number one, Hoxton Square, London. In episode one, I listed a few biographical and character traits shared by my hero, my father, Dr. Gerald Stern, and my hero's hero, Jimmy P. I told you I grew up thinking of Jimmy P as a family member. For Dad, it was even more intimate. Dad knew Jimmy P long before he knew me or my siblings, and in one way or another, he spent most of his adult life with him. Dad's entire career, his life's work, was devoted to the treatment and research of Parkinson's disease, in the form of pills, patients, and people. On the pill front, Dad was a key player in the development of game-changing drugs like levodopamine. If you've read Oliver Sacks' book, Awakenings, or seen the Hollywood version starring Robert De Niro and Robin Williams, you'll know what an extraordinary experiment that was. On the patient front, when I was four years old, Dad was one of the three founders of the Parkinson's Disease Society, which has since morphed into one of Britain's biggest medical charities, Parkinson's UK. On the people front, Dad helped found the European Federation of Neurological Societies at a time when the Cold War was building iron curtains, not bridges, between scientists. In 1992, Dad ran the show when the World Congress of Neurology was held in London. I had little idea of this achievement at the time, as I was then starting my career as a journalist in the Far East. Dad retired from the National Health Service in 1995. He did the odd bit of private practice, most notably at the Vatican. There, Dad politely declined the invitation of his old Polish Parkinson's patient to kiss his ring. But now I want to tell you how Dad and his hero James Parkinson grew even closer after Dad's retirement. Why did Dad collect all that material I found in his study for the story I've just told you? Even fewer people know this story than know the popgun plot yarn I just spun you. I reckon James Parkinson would have loved this story. By now, I hope you've got to know our Hoxton Square physician well enough to agree, but see what you think. When he died in 2018, Dad had been retired for more than 20 years. Second to seeing his children and grandchildren thrive, Dad's greatest retirement pleasure was seeing his former protégés around the world thrive. In Georgian England, James Parkinson corresponded with like-minded reformers around Britain by means of the postal service. More than two centuries later, Dad connected with his global network of former protégés by means of international neurological conferences. This was possible because nearly all of Dad's former research students, who he'd hand-picked from around the world, then returned home to become top neurologists in their native countries. Just as Dad had organized the 1992 World Congress of Neurology in London, the birthplace he shared with Jimmy P., his protégés were now organizing their own international conferences. They wanted Dad to be there. They wanted to feast with and gossip with their former mentor, but they also wanted to give their own students the benefits they'd enjoyed of hearing Dad lecture, encourage them, offer his opinion on tricky cases at their hospitals. Just as Dad had learned certain values from his mentors, Dad's protégés now felt the same duty to pass on Dad's lessons to the next generation. Lessons of compassion, empathy, observation, and listening. There was, however, one major difference between the way Dad had operated and the way his protégés did. Money. In James Parkinson's era, it had been possible for gifted individuals to achieve great things without the benefit of money or title. But by my dad's time, at least in the field of medical research, ingenuity and passion were no longer enough. You needed lots of money. Dad, for reasons I'll come on to, personally controlled a substantial Parkinson's research fund. Not a penny came from big pharmaceutical companies. Dad had complete control 
over his own budget and how he spent it. Growing up, I knew none of this. In the way all children ignore dadisms, my siblings and I never wondered why dad kept saying, with a smile, we should be nice to old ladies. I had little idea what it was he did between dropping us off at school in the morning and reading us bedtime stories at night. But one day, as I was taking the first steps down my own career path, I personally experienced the lengths Dad went to in order to find the best and the brightest. It was the mid-90s, and I was a rookie TV news journalist in Tokyo. One day, out of the blue, Dad called to ask a favor. He was thinking of recruiting a research scientist for his Parkinson's research team. He said this researcher looked great on paper, but he couldn't meet him as he was currently working in Japan. Before inviting him to join his team in London, Dad wanted me to meet him, look him in the eye, and generally check he was a decent chap. Now, I was in my 20s. My only qualifications were a degree in Chinese and four years trading textiles. I had no science background. Ah, Dad said, but you see, this researcher is from Shanghai, and you speak Chinese and I don't. I protested that I was completely unqualified to be a juror for such an important verdict way outside my area of expertise. But Dad assured me that he trusted my judgment of character. It was a minor precaution, just to double-check this researcher was indeed the kind of bloke you'd want to share a lab with for two years. I was really very reluctant, but Dad gave me the impression it was actually just a chance for him to show off that he had a Chinese-speaking son working in Japan. I began to think there was no harm in indulging Dad's paternal pride. Dad was proud of his children and always encouraged us to choose our own paths. But on reflection, he played me like a fish. I agreed to meet this Chinese researcher. Arranging the appointment proved to be far from easy, however. I was a junior dog's body at a new job in the unpredictable business of TV news. After some false starts and last-minute postponements, and at a day's notice, we finally fixed a date. Now, I warned him it would have to be brief and I might have to cancel at the last minute if news broke out. But it didn't. So, at noon the next day, we met at a park near the ABC News Tokyo Bureau. We bought a couple of onigiri rice balls, we selected cans of hot coffee from a vending machine, found an empty bench, and chatted for 20 minutes or so. He turned out to be a delightful bloke. I'd given him the thumbs up the moment I saw his shy, smiling face, but as we said goodbye, I channeled my inner member of the royal family and asked him had he travelled far. This was when he told me he'd just spent eight hours on a public bus to come and meet me. He was now about to catch the bus back. As he waved goodbye and disappeared down the subway station steps, it sunk in. This top researcher, this rising star in the hot new field of stem cell research, who had already been headhunted by top-notch research teams in the US and Japan, had embarked on a 16-hour road trip by bus just for a 20-minute chat with Dr. Gerald Stern's non-scientist son. This was my first adult insight into the esteem in which Dad was held and his idiosyncratic approach to recruitment. This Chinese researcher spent two years as part of Dad's Parkinson's disease research team in London. After a stint at a top U.S. research university, he was tempted back home where he set up China's top Parkinson's research facility. So it was that he joined the growing ranks of Dad's former protégés around the world. After Dad retired, he too started inviting his former mentor to speak at neurological conferences that he was organizing. But he, like the rest of the medical world and unlike Dad, had masters to please, budgets to be approved, bean counters to satisfy. You may know that almost all medical research, conferences, and journals depend on Big Pharma for funding. You may also be familiar with some of the ethical conflicts this can cause. 
I'll come on to how Dad came to be the only independent researcher in his field, but suffice to say, his kind of independence was unique, unheard of in his field. When Dad's eminent protégés around the world wanted to invite him to their conferences, they didn't enjoy the same discretion Dad had when he'd hired them. They had to do it by the book. In the submission forms demanded by the purse holders, in the box for keynote speaker, you couldn't just put, my former teacher, or in the box for topic, to be confirmed. So they had to do what James Parkinson, a lowly physician in a world still dominated by the aristocratic elite, had had to do. They had to do what Dad, the barely educated son of a Bethnal Green tobacconist aspiring to join the double-barreled country estate world of post-war British neurology, had had to do. They had to hustle. Get creative. Come up with what Dad liked to call a good wheeze. They'd learned from the best and had learned well. To get the bean counters to sign off on their conference invitations for Dad, they came up with not one, but two cracking wheezes. Wheeze number one worked well for the first few years after Dad's retirement. His ex-protégés would invite Dad to lecture on traditional clinical practice, what civilians call observing and listening. This was nothing as dramatic as Jimmy P taking on the establishment to save his friends from the gallows, but in its own way, choosing this topic was Dad's subtle act of resistance against the rising tide of big science. One of Dad's major concerns about Big Pharma's influence on medical research was that the science was increasingly being directed not by patient care, but by profit. Dad admired all the astonishing recent technological breakthroughs, the brave new world technologies of molecular biology, genetic analysis, and big data. But he was also wary that blindly following them risked neglecting the kind of old-school doctoring he'd learned from his hero, Jimmy P. The more focus doctors gave to technology, the less attention they paid to traditional tricks of the trade. Tricks like taking a careful patient history. Tricks like compassion, empathy, observing, and listening. The kind of thing that makes you spot a distinctive shuffling gait from across Hoxton Square and make a note. Or listen to people with mental illness rather than leave them to rot in an asylum. This then became wheeze number one. Across the world, Dad's protégés colluded against the bean counters. They justified Dad's keynote speaker's invitation, first-class ticket and five-star accommodation for him and Mum by billing him as an expert in clinical practice, what you and I know as bedside manner, or, more simply, listening. Better include a lecture on clinical practice, they'd tell their bean counters. Maybe we could get Dr. Gerald Stern. Uh, he puts on a great show and is much in demand, but luckily I have a personal connection. You know, I might just be able to persuade him to favour our conference with his presence. Wee's one worked like a dream for many years, but began to run out of steam the second time round. This was the problem. No matter how they dressed it up, it was bureaucratically awkward to justify inviting Dad to deliver the same lecture twice. But Dad spent decades recruiting research colleagues largely on the basis of their resourcefulness and creativity. He was a wheeze master and had taught them all he knew. So his ex-protégés came up with wheeze number two, which turned out to be even better than wheeze number one. Wheeze two became a cast-iron guaranteed pass for Dad to elude conference auditing bouncers in perpetuity. Their cunning plan? They invited Dad to deliver a lecture on the man who gave his name to the disease they all studied, James Parkinson. As a cunning plan specialist himself, and to be honest, Dad wasn't entirely uninvolved in this one, Wheeze too was right up his maverick, nonconformist street. What bean counter, what box ticker could possibly object to a lecture on the life and times of the physician who gave his name to the disease they studied. Or, more accurately, as you now know, to whom his name was given decades after his death. This, then, was how Dad came to assemble all the research on the life of this humble physician of Number 1 Hoxton Square in his study. 
This, then, is the material I've used to tell you the story of the heroic role played in a plot to assassinate the king by someone you've all heard of. But I've not yet told you the story of how Dad managed his entire career developing groundbreaking medical treatments without taking a penny from Big Pharma. Dad's unique independent career based on complete control of a substantial research fund didn't involve any wheezes, cunning plans, or bureaucrat bamboozling. It came straight from the playbook of my hero's hero, Jimmy P. Episode 10. Be nice to old ladies. <laughs> Dad always used to tell my sister, my brother, and me to be nice to old ladies. So far as I know, it's not directly related to the example set by his hero, Jimmy P., when he went out of his way to help Margaret Davis find her press-ganged son, George. It was a family dadism, a trigger for teenage eye-rolling and headshakes, long before we understood why he was so fond of this phrase. After a while, we started to notice how visiting colleagues would use the phrase too, always evoking strange, knowing smiles. We suspected it was some punchline to one of his many stories. Dad was a great storyteller, especially in what he liked to call his anecdotage. But his stories were all self-deprecatory, casting himself as the naive fool or klutzy ingenue. By the time Dad died, just before his 88th birthday, we thought we'd heard them all. But as the eulogies flowed in, we discovered we didn't know half of them. Tribute after tribute told stories of young medics he'd set on the path to eminence through small acts of kindness and support in the toughest of circumstances. But long before he died, we were aware of his story about the importance of being nice to old ladies. I have mentioned that one superpower my hero shared with his hero, Jimmy P, was listening. Dad's old lady story was about the power of listening and how lightning can strike twice. It's also the answer to the question I've left hanging, how Dad managed his entire distinguished research career without having to take a single penny from big pharmaceutical companies. In the early 1960s, after working in various junior positions and research jobs around the world, most recently Newcastle, Dad got his first job as a consultant neurologist in London. These were the early years of the National Health Service. For the first time, ordinary citizens could get equal access to top quality treatment. Patients who'd never been able to afford such expertise were now being referred to consultants without having to pay a penny or even prove that they could pay a penny towards the cost. When he took over his predecessor's job in London, Dad also inherited his predecessor's NHS patients. Dad particularly enjoyed seeing one of them, the last surviving spinster sibling from a large family. As this was the 1960s, she'd grown up in Victorian and Edwardian England, where families were big, and the youngest daughter was expected to forego marriage to care for the father. This patient of Dad's had done her duty. Now, in her own old age, she'd developed a tremor, which was why, every six months, she'd appear in the consulting rooms of the young Dr. Gerald Stern. Dad liked to schedule her for the last appointment of the day. He enjoyed her company. Long after they'd concluded their medical business, he'd listen to her stories and chat about trivial matters. This old lady never missed an appointment, until one day, she did. A few days later, a call from her general practitioner doctor confirmed she'd died in her sleep. A few weeks later, a call from her solicitor advised that he'd been mentioned in her will. A few months later, a visit to the solicitor's chambers at London's Inner Temple informed him that, after the dog's home and the cat's home, Dad was third on her list of beneficiaries. How thoughtful, said Dad to the solicitor. She was such a nice old lady. The solicitor said that her will had mentioned her appreciation of that nice Dr. Stern, 
and how much she looked forward to her appointments with him, as he was such a good listener. Dad was moved by this, and thanked the solicitor for informing him in person. Privately, he wondered if this kind gesture would cover the cost of the taxi fare to get back to the hospital, as he had patients to see. He asked what the old lady had bequeathed him. Six hundred, replied the solicitor. Dad was astonished. He'd never imagined that quiet, drably-dressed old lady even possessed as much as six hundred pounds, a substantial sum in those days. No, six hundred thousand pounds, said the solicitor. This small fortune was a personal bequest naming Dad as the beneficiary. Like Jimmy P. and the surgical trust he invented, Dad had a chance to stop working and live a very comfortable life of leisure. Like Jimmy P., he passed up the opportunity. Instead, he used it to set up his research fund for Parkinson's disease. Then, a few years later, exactly the same thing happened. Another nice old lady, another visit to the inner temple, another small fortune, only bigger this time, another lightning strike. The research fund grew, and that's why Dad never took a penny from Big Pharma for his research. And that's why Dad always told us to be nice to old ladies. So, you've now heard my stories about my hero, my father, Dr. Gerald Stern, and his hero, James Parkinson. While Dad was alive, I tried for years to interest broadcasters in the story of Jimmy P's heroic risking of his own neck to save the lives of his friends accused of high treason and destined for the gibbet. I tried pitching it as a documentary, as a docudrama, even as straight drama, but no luck. There are plenty of reasons why my pitch was rejected, of course. For a start, historical drama, or even 18th century docudrama reenactments, are expensive. There are also so many competing stories pitched by people with better industry connections and better track records than me. Even for such insiders, only a tiny percentage of their proposals end up getting made. Sometimes I'd be given more technical reasons for this story's unsuitability, explaining the complications or imperfections of the story itself. I've been told things like, the central courtroom drama of James's risking his life to save his friends is too convoluted and complex to have any impact. Or they'd say, mm, the verbatim stuff is nice, but the language is too complicated for people to understand these days. Or sometimes, it's inappropriate to distract from the narrative of curing and treating such a serious disease. On top of that, I'm a journalist and documentary filmmaker by trade, and it turns out there's not much video archive available from 1794. Now, all these objections are true and have prevented me from telling this story publicly until now. Even in this podcast, however, I have to consider how far to stretch my limited budget of strict historical truth. How much could I loosen my fact-checking girdle? How far I could nudge the needle on the fact to fictionometer. For example, coming up with even one female character was a real stretch. We know almost nothing about Jimmy P's wife, Mary. This makes episode six, all that small hours agonizing between James and Mary Parkinson in the Hoxton Square family quarters, entirely speculative. On the other hand, the dramatic climax of episode seven's Privy Council trial is, as I explained, almost entirely verbatim from contemporary records. Now, does this make any of the story I've told in this The Truth Lies in Bedtime Stories podcast more or less important? Any more or less compelling, engaging, or entertaining? Like Dad, I sometimes like to speculate on what James Parkinson would have made of it all. Like all good writers, communicators, teachers, and mentors, like my dad, Jimmy P. would have known what makes a good story. I'd have loved to have been able to chat about this, the three of us, Dad, me, and Jimmy P. We could have discussed it over a meal at Number One Hoxton Square, as it's now a trendy branch of a restaurant chain. The original building has been demolished, but as we go in, Dad and I could point out the blue plaque on the wall outside, honouring 
its celebrated former occupant. What would Dad, me, and Jimmy P. have talked about? Over dinner? And a bottle or two of wine? In the dining room that used to be where the physician's waiting room had once been? Dad could have told Jimmy about all the research papers, the books, the medical journals and conferences he's been involved in that bear James Parkinson's name. What would Jimmy have made of the collection of historical documents Dad assembled for Wee's number two? I can imagine Jimmy P. spending the whole evening shaking his head at that blue plaque. Of all the things to be remembered for, nearly two centuries after his death, that obscure essay on the shaking palsy. It barely caused a ripple at the time, he might have said. Dad, me, and Jimmy P. could speculate, from our different perspectives, on why James Parkinson is now a household name for that obscure pamphlet and not for volunteering to save his friends in a sensational trial for high treason. We'd been at it until closing time, wondering what makes some stories endure and others evaporate. I'm sure before long the conversation would have turned to the topic of compassion, empathy, observation and listening. Dad could tell Jimmy about how, in 1969, he founded the Parkinson's Disease Society with the sister of one of his patients. I can imagine Jimmy, with his experience of Margaret and George Davis and his reform of his local lunatic asylum in Hoxton, being fascinated by this pioneering patient and carer support network. He'd be even more astonished to hear how it became Parkinson's UK one of Britain's biggest and best-funded medical charities. Dad wouldn't have bought it up himself, but once I'd explained to Jimmy what a website was, I would have told him that the Parkinson's UK website doesn't include a single mention of Dad's name or his founding role. I was literally in the room when it happened, I'd tell Jimmy, though as I was four years old at the time, I can't claim to be an expert witness. Dad was of that uncomplaining wartime generation and never spoke to me about this, but I imagine Jimmy's sense of justice would have been pretty outraged. What can I do to redress this injustice? I imagine he'd ask me. Email hello at parkinsons.org.uk, I'd tell him, before explaining what email was. If, having heard this story, you'd like to ask them yourselves, by all means do some redressing yourself. That's hello at parkinsons.org.uk. But back to the point about how some stories land and others sink. It's not that forgotten stories are always worse than the ones we know about. Some might be deliberately suppressed if they don't suit the narrative of the power brokers. The Attorney General who had it in for Jimmy, John Scott, did his best to control the proliferating newspapers and news sheets in 1794. I could have told Jimmy about the way the state controls the media in China or Russia. Jimmy would probably have been wise and experienced enough to observe that media manipulation can come in many forms. The subtle versions can direct narratives just as effectively as the heavy-handed ones. At this point, I chime in with my three-headed beasts analogy, describing how the three snapping, biting, snarling heads of government, business, and media, connected below the neck by power and below the waist by money, thrive in all parts of the money mire, democratic as well as autocratic. The three of us being, in our different ways, analytic types, we might get to pondering over the port, on the reasons why some stories stick and others flop. Some stories might not make the cut, we might reflect, because they lack one element of narrative or have one complication or twist too many. We like our stories to adhere to certain tropes, to fit into certain boxes. If they don't fit, we can try filling them out or chipping away at them until they do. But even if we can cram our favoured story into some box or other, there will always be plenty of competing stories, true and not, that fit perfectly. Most of the time, we might agree as we drain our glasses and call for the bill, the reason why most stories evaporate, fail to cut through, gain no traction or leave no trace, is simply down to luck. On our way out, we might pass a busker on Hoxton Square. Jimmy might ask how many great musicians with more talent than their famous colleagues busk. 
undiscovered, on street corners. Dad could point out that we can never know the answer because, well, they're undiscovered. So, stories can get buried, ignored, or simply wither away for all sorts of reasons. There's one more reason, though, I'd want to point out before we embrace and go our separate ways. If stories are particularly awkward, unpleasant, or inconvenient, it's precisely their truth, their very awkward, unpleasant, and inconvenient nature that makes it so hard for us to embrace them. Doesn't make them any less true, though. If you enjoyed The Quiet Revolutionary, why not try teetering? How a Hawaiian beach bum held my career in the balance. Thank you for listening. The series was written, narrated and produced by Sternwriter. Audio production by Samuel Wynn. The Truth Lies in Bedtime Stories is a see-through news production. See-through news is a not-for-profit social media network with the goal of speeding up carbon drawdown by helping the inactive become active. For more, visit seethroughnews.org. Thank you for listening.